All right, uh, so, yeah. um, welcome, welcome everybody to the AI regulation panel. Um, so my name is uh, Kurt Opsahl. I am uh, the Associate General Counsel for Cybersecurity and Civil Liberties Policy at the Filecoin Foundation. I've also spent many years working for the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, on a couple of other boards and generally have been Skip um, Okay. So, uh, in any event, uh, so we're here to talk about the... Welcome, uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome. Um, where is that coming from? Yeah, uh, perhaps there is something... Uh, doing a mic check in another room. So that'll let me make this an exciting panel. Uh, we'll have to determine whether it's actually us talking or the ghost in the room. So, uh, but thank you for bearing with us. So anyway, we're, we're here to talk about uh, AI regulation. The, the question posed being you know, whether Congress or the European Union would get it right. To sort of set the stage for that a little bit, the European Union has passed AI regulation that uh, went into force uh, about a month ago, though the regulations will will be uh, effective over the course of the next uh, six months to a couple of years. Uh, so it'll be slowly brought into play. Congress has not, uh, and uh, just you know, as a, as a currently, it is very difficult for Congress to do anything. So um, you know, I would not be counting on them doing any something. Uh, right away, and certainly not during the election season when they're more focused on elections. Uh, but nevertheless, the other question is how to get it right, and that is something which is facing not only the EU and Congress, but countries around the world, and also the various uh, uh, sub sub uh, divisions like states. Uh, several states in the U.S. have uh, passed or proposed various uh, AI regulations. So anyway, to get this panel started, we are going to go down the uh, the line here, introduce ourselves, and then we will go down the line again to uh, say a few words about uh, the, the topic here. And then once we've sort of set the stage a little bit, uh, we'll open it up for your questions and get into this as a, as a conversation. Good morning, everyone. Still morning, yeah. Uh, Dwayne Gatesell, I'm a lawyer from Austin, Texas. Hi, I'm Matthew Lane, I'm Senior Policy Counsel at Fight for the Future. Uh, Amy Stepanovich, I am the Vice President for U.S. Policy at the Future Privacy Forum. Um, Mitch Stoltz, uh, I'm the uh, IP Litigation Director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Excellent, and so let's like make it a boomerang here. So Mitch, you want to start out saying a few things and then we'll go down the line back this direction. Sure, so uh, to answer the question posed by this panel, uh, sometimes Congress and the EU can get it right, and sometimes they can't. Uh, there are real concerns with AI, and there are not so real concerns. And I think the ones that lawmakers are addressing right now are uh, some real concerns and some not so real. Uh, and, I, and I think it largely reflects the Broader, broader disputes uh, about what are the harms of AI? Are they are they existential risk? Are they um, uh, sort of AI is going to replace humans? Is it maybe some of the scenarios out of science fiction? Um, or are they more prosaic but equally, uh, but but but, but um, possibly more harmful in the short term? Um, will AI uh, uh, replace jobs? Will it lead to uh, people being impersonated, uh, exploited, um, uh, deceived? Um, and will, I think the, a lot of the real problems, um, and some of the laws now are, 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 are proposed laws are, are, are addressing this, you know, are, are not so much what AI will do, but what people will misuse AI for, what people will do with AI that it probably shouldn't be done. Uh, and please you note, know, when I say AI, that's uh, it's a broad term and a bit misleading. AI is sort of any, almost any cutting edge uh, uh, technology for decision making is, 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 is called AI right now. And I think, you know, often we're talking about things like large language models, like image generators, um, various applications of neural networks. Um, the, uh, there are real harms, and, and, and some of them are starting to be addressed. Uh, but 
the uh, a lot of, there's there are a lot of attempts of, uh, to re out there right now to you know, regulate the technology and, and those to me are problematic uh, um, trying to regulate the um, you know size and complexity of foundation models you know, you know, regulate the you know how many GPU chips you know one organization can can own um, uh, those are both unlikely to work and, and uh, I think probably chasing the wrong problem and uh, concentrating power and power over these, uh, um, uh, this technology in a few hands, uh, which is going to have terrible um, implications in the, in, in the long run. The, 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 the smarter proposals and, and, and the more, I, I think, sober and, and, and effective proposals are, are, are to look at you know what are the misuses that we're seeing right now, and let's let's target those uses. So so the use of um, deep fakes and uh, impersonation, you know, to you know for you know say to to influence elections, to uh, to do non consensual intimate imagery, to do um, uh, you know you know create you know, f the impression of a false endorsement uh, of, of of someone, right, right, right. We we can we can target those, and the, the better proposals do target those. Um, vastly expanding people's sort of sort of a property right in 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 one's likeness uh, against anyone who might want to you know create a likeness of a person. That's 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 overbroad. It's overreaction, and, and, and it probably reflects agendas that were out there already before the b b before the technological shift that we're seeing. Um, concerns about labor, concerns about people essentially being being uh, especially creative labor being replaced by AI. Right? Those are those are those are real. Those are serious, and the best. Um, Solutions to them out, out there right now are things like the um, contracts that were reached by the the, the, the Writers Guild and, and the the Screen Actors Guild uh, after the strikes, um, uh, which uh, you know are, are are getting at that that specific issue and and not trying to um, regulate the technology and who can own it and 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 what it's what it's capable of doing. Um, so I, I'd probably start with, with three points. The first is that um, harms cause... Thank by you. Please keep moving to the front of the room. You're All welcome. of the ribbon trading is happening towards the front of the room. So maybe we could yeah, get somebody from yeah. the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's I think they just, they're just attached to the wrong speakers. But anyway... Thank you for being in the front of the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that then would they're be learning amazing. a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're going to learn so much about AI without even realizing that they want to. Um, where is I? Three points. One is that the, the harms from AI are going to be felt on multiple different levels. So people will individually feel harms from AI if it is not um, deployed responsibly, ethically. Um, but that won't be the end of it. We're going to have community-based harms that impact whole groups of people, and there will be societal harms that impact everybody. Um, and in order to properly regulate the use of AI, I think we have to address harms um, and think through them at each of these different levels distinctly um, to figure out what needs to be um, written into the laws and regulations that we're going to talk about. So that would be point one. Point two is um, a lot of people in the privacy field, I think, have been really out in front of regulations on AI because AI is, um, in a large part, built upon data. And when the AI is meant to deal with people, that data is often personal data and there's a lot of it. And so privacy people have been thinking about AI for quite some time. Um, and in some ways, privacy regulations are the first AI regulations. Um, my colleagues on um, Future Privacy Forum's global team have written a really wonderful report looking at um, the enforcement of the General Data Protection Regulation, which is the EU's um, privacy law, um, in AI contexts, and have found dozens of instances when regulators have been um, using GDPR to enforce um, and apply rules to the development and use of AI. So it is not without regulation, even before we start talking about AI specific laws, um, both uh, global and US state 
um, regulation on privacy does look at, um, does hit at some core principles and protections for the use of AI. And then the third thing that I would hit on is what we're already seeing. I think we're, we've addressed this a little bit, but um, yes, people will be um, regulating on AI. People have already regulated AI on, on AI. Um, we do have the EU AI Act, as Kurt said. We have a comprehensive AI law in Colorado. Um, one thing I like to point out about the uh, Colorado law is that it passed after the EU Act but they've written in, in an enforcement date, a day when it comes into full force before the AI Act. So it will actually be the first um, fully operational AI law, even though it didn't pass first, which I think was just a really cute little thing that Colorado did there. Um, in California, there's a bill, 1047, that just passed through the Senate and is heading to the governor's desk. So that could be the second comprehensive AI law in the um, United States. Um, and those laws will, even though they're at the state level, have national, international effect. Because once companies start complying with them, they're not going to develop necessarily one tool for this state and one tool for that state and then one tool for everybody else. Instead, they're going to put um, these protections in force more broadly um, in a lot of their tools. So um, it has been said a lot on the Electronic Frontiers track already this weekend. I will say it again, a rising tide raises all boats. Um, so once we're getting these protections in place, we're all going to benefit, and we're already seeing those laws out there coming to pass, and we can talk a little bit more about what's in them, but those would be, I think, the three frames that I would introduce. All right. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, yeah, to answer the question, I think the answer is no, and I don't think that there necessarily should be an expectation that the government, whether they be US or EU, get it right the first time around. I think that there are, three major hurdles here. Um, the first one is just language. Uh, I'm a big fan of the English language. It gives us things like puns and double and triple entendres, but when you actually try to write law, you run into the problem of like, what do words even mean? Which sounds like a silly problem, but it comes up a lot when it comes to legal drafting and interpretation. And uh, I just remember a coalition meeting where someone said, everyone should support this definition of AI. It's not great, but it's the best we have so far. <laughs> and so it's just really hard to just even write definitions for the software. Um, this, this kind of like leads into my second major hurdle, which is just institutionalism. Um, most governments are not set up to draft laws that involve complicated subject matter. Um, I am a part-time lobbyist, and I know that a lot of times that uh, offices learn about things from lobbyists, which is kind of a problem when it comes to whether or not the person giving the information is giving you the full picture, or whether or not they're a trusted advisor, um, whether or not they're trying to manipulate you to steer you in a certain direction. Um, there needs to be more technologists, more experts within these institutions that can help evaluate these things and to suggest language and frameworks and models. Um, and that's somewhat missing. Uh, the last is just there is a lack of culture and expectation of fixing their work. Um, and this is something that's kind of a shame. Uh, it's, uh, in the US, at least, it's left a lot to agencies to figure it out. Uh, post Chevron, that is not impossible, but a little bit more difficult. And so um, there's just not this like idea that we're going to pass a big law and then look at it and see how we did in three years and come back and then pass a big fixing law that fixes all the problems and then maybe three years later do that again. Uh, most of the time, it, members are just so psychologically scarred from passing a large, complicated, and like contentious bill that they don't want to think about it again for like a decade. Um, so, you know, where we are is I think that we're probably going to start with a lot of uh, the floor and build up from there. Um, I'll just give you an example. Fight has endorsed the Defiance Act. Um, we do not believe that this is a bill that fully fixes the problem. Uh, all it does is clarify that the Violence Against Women Act provides protections um, non-gendered to people who are victims of non-consensual intimate imagery. Um, and like 
for victims, uh, finding a lawyer, filing a lawsuit, like that is for most people out of reach and problematic, but creating solutions that respect the First Amendment and work and across all sort of instances is ex incredibly challenging and is gonna require a lot of thought. And so in the meantime, like these are the kinds of laws we think should be passed today. Um, I think it's important when we're trying to answer this question of you know, whether the EU or, or Congress will get it right is to discuss a little bit about what's been done. In the United States, uh, President Biden issued an executive order in October of last year that's really the first federal level uh, attempt to try to get their arms around this. And as you might expect, it's in the United States more of a laissez-faire approach where it's supposed to provide general guidelines uh, for various agencies and so forth versus having each individual agency, for example, the Defense Department was wrestling with this issue and how do we deal with AI from a defense perspective. Other agencies have been looking at it. So this is the first comprehensive attempt to set a general regulation, but the problem is with an executive order, it can be rescinded by the next administration. So it's a temporary thing that may or may not be paid attention to as things go forward. Whereas Europe, they've actually passed the law. And what they've tried to do is to categorize risk. And so there are certain things that they have said, this is unacceptable and is not allowed. And there are other things that they have in a three-tiered structure, high risk, medium, and low risk. And the requirements are different depending on the risk level. But there has to be reporting, there has to be transparency, and it's, uh, there's obligations not only on the providers, but also on um, the, the firms, the companies that then utilize that data for retail customers. And there is also a, um, a fine structure built in that if you don't comply, if you violate the terms, the, the fines are enormous. I think it's up to I don't know, 35 million euros uh, or 7% of a company's gross output. So they're very, very serious fines. Whereas our executive order, for example, doesn't have any enforcement mechanism built into it yet. So I think the hope is that in the United States that Congress will take up the executive order, decide to draft a law that will be more along the lines of either the executive order or in line with the EU, but it hasn't happened yet, and as someone has, I think it was Kurt, mentioned the odds of that happening in an election year are virtually zero, if not zero. But it's kind of a, hopefully we'll get to it sooner rather than later. The problem is the technology is changing by the day. And so the law is going to necessarily be way behind the technology. And as Matt said, legislating to technology isn't exactly Congress's strong suit. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of give that general background as far as what has each country done and then we can perhaps better discuss whether part of it is right or not. Hi everyone. Sorry for being a little bit late. I was at the wrong room. Um, <laughs> but my name is Rich Gatz. I'm head of cyber claims at Arch Insurance, uh, an attorney that handles cybersecurity slash data privacy issues for global corporations. Um, so I, I, if I have the question right in my head, which I hope I do, because I did walk in late, um, I think that um, I think that we're we're kind of on the right track. Now again, I work in in private industry. I'm not a lobbyist. I don't work for the government. I'm a data privacy advocate, but I'm not like I'm I'm not these people over here because the jobs they do are, are really difficult. But also, I, I come from a different different mental paradigm, and so when I think of AI, right, the first thing I do think of is the EU regulations. And it's, and I think when I was walking in, um, someone mentioned GDPR. So hopefully I'm not rehashing their point. But GDPR really got a lot of things right in the data privacy context. Okay, and as, as was also said, you know, a rising tide raises everyone. Like it forced America and other countries to kind of become more focused on data privacy so that they could have intra-country transfers with e European Union countries, okay? And a lot of the large companies want to do business in the EU. So what you do from a compliance perspective, if you do want to do business in a country that has a more stringent regulatory framework, you make your processes, platforms, and your business compliant with the most strict regulation of any jurisdiction that you're doing business in. 
And so when GDPR came out, everyone was like losing their minds. It's like, oh my God, how are we gonna get compliant and all this stuff, and, and companies did, right? Now I'm, I'm gonna be interested to see if we have kind of um, consumer AI lobbyists, that, like we, you guys are familiar with uh, uh, Mr. Schrems? who's a data privacy advocate who has successfully sued in the European Union court to invalidate several um, agreements between the United States and the EU in regards to data transfers, basically saying, hey, what the United States has, it was called the Privacy Shield, and then some subsequent ones, isn't, doesn't actually meet the standards of the EU data privacy rules. So I think we're going to see something like that where companies are going to have to, by the nature of their business, comply with the European Union guidelines and that is then gonna force them to be better about managing their AI in the United <laughs> States. Now, I, I do definitely agree that, that Congress does have kind of a, a technological handicap. Um, you know, I mean, they didn't even know how Facebook worked. So <laughs> to expect them to understand artificial intelligence and learning language models and things like that is a very heavy ask. But I, I'm, I'm somewhat hopeful that um, we'll be able to use the EU regulations and then you know some of the state regulations to kind of create a little bit more of a expansive federal platform to kind of protect consumers. Well, they got the internet right about a series of tubes, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. so. I mean, in a sense, the series of. Uh, all right, so yeah, I, I think we're gonna have uh, some, some great points here. I'll uh, just add, add a few, maybe try and call this thing. So uh, we have a set of like, you know, what is it to get get things right? Uh, and this is a difficult thing for, for any legislature to do, whether, whether it's the EU or, or the Congress or state governments and so on. Um, and some of it is the also on the disagreement as to what getting it right is. And then there's the challenges of actually doing so, even if you agree on, on the end purpose. So as you know, we, we've hit on some of these notes here, there are a lot of potential issues that people are trying to solve for or deal with in, in regulation. There are sort of here and now issues uh, where there are people who are maybe you know making uh, fake imagery that's uh, very realistic for disinformation purposes, or there there are people who are relying upon an AI answer on thing and has hallucinated that answer, or you know a, a car uh, a driverless car using AI and, and makes a mistake. Uh, and some of the more you know pernicious uh, issues are when governments are using it in some cases for. Um, you know, analysis or social scoring on their uh, on their citizens, and which is you know uh, it falls under that unacceptable category for the EU AI Act that they have said that that is uh, an unacceptable use in their four four scale range. Um, the other sort of issue is like, are we looking way forward? And a lot of people who work in AI issues are concerned about artificial general intelligence, sort of a path to a, uh, an AI that becomes self-aware, and uh, as you know, many of you have probably read science fiction uh, on that subject. Usually it doesn't work out well, uh, though uh, I guess there, there are a few, uh, few science fictions where the AI has become self-aware and then sort of treats people as pets, and maybe that's a more, more friendly uh, end result. Uh, but this is a, this is a quite a range of different things to try to capture in in a regulation, and some of the other challenges for it, and we've hit upon this as, as well, is that uh, legislatures are uh, often not the most uh, technically adept, but even if they are aware of and, and understanding the technology as it exists at any given moment of time and pass a regulation that is sensible for how that technology is, the technology. Uh, moves at a pace faster than uh, regulations do. And so it, it, if you have a regulation that is focused on technology that is then becomes outdated, superseded, and irrelevant in a future point, you have to either update that regulation or you have weirdness occurs where you're trying to apply regulation that was written for different paradigms. Uh, and we've seen this throughout tech policy for you know uh, several several decades. Is you know several of the prominent uh, laws uh, dealing with uh, technology and, and from the U.S. Congress have their roots in legislation passed in the 80s, uh, based on understandings of how email worked, and, they, and certainly no understanding of the web because it didn't exist then. Uh, so this this is a a, uh, a tough challenge. Uh, 
but what is it? What does it mean? Sort of the you know broader principles of what it is to sort of get it get it right. Well, uh, at least in, in my view, is is policymakers should be very careful about how they regulate it uh, to ensure that they don't make uh, overburdensome regulations that that stifle uh, innovation or have unattended uh, consequences that are perhaps driven by the the fears of of the day or fears of some you know future general intelligence or such that will. Uh, make it more difficult to find the best use cases for for AI. Um, policymakers should also be mindful of, at least in the United States, uh, of regulating code in a way that impacts you know, it. Code is speech is a is a principle that we have uh, pretty well established within uh, within the U.S. And code is speech is a is a good. Uh, protection that allows people to put code out there and has you know, restrictions on whether the government can say this is how you can code this, that, or the other. Instead, frame it sort of not as this, you know, regulating the technology so much as the activities, the bad activities that we're trying to suppress or the good activities that we're trying to encourage. is sort of a, a better way forward. Um, and more, more generally, uh, one of my, my concerns is that uh, uh, it's about consolidation, that we are um, moving towards a lot of the AI in innovation is being done by a handful of, uh, of companies that are backed by the existing uh, tech giants of the day. Uh, and that is some of the challenges that we have faced now for, for a while. Uh, with just a few sort of uh, an, an oligopoly of a few uh, tech companies that have a dominant role in a lot of what we do online in uh, social media and communications and such. And if that power base continues to, or, uh, to be the uh, drivers of the next stage of AI, and if AI uh, achieves some of the, the promises that it has, then we will end up in a world in which it is a centralized set of AI, which are driven by these uh, these corporations who have had a you know a, a challenging track record on things like uh, protecting people's privacy or putting people's interests above the the users. I would uh, um, a little closer. Uh, how's that? Okay. Uh, and so it would be much uh, preferable to have, if you have an AI that is working for you, that is an assistant to help you in, in your life and its interest is aligned with your interest, so that AI could help you, uh, you know, navigate privacy uh, cookie settings and take care of that for you to make sure it has your, your settings or help you find the, the best deal or identify when something looks like a, a phishing email and doing so for you, for your interest and not for its, uh, you know, originator or corporate uh, corporate overlord. And this is you know, trying to help with some of the, uh, the labor problems. Uh, one of the you know, big issues that we mentioned earlier is that uh, if we have a world in which everybody's uh, labor is being replaced by robots and artificial intelligence machines that do all the work, under the current uh, uh, circumstances, that likely leads to all that work being done, people being uh, uh, unemployed uh, and because they can't get a, get a job, and then they don't have any money to buy the things that the AI are, are producing, and sort of we get into a, uh, a terrible path. Uh, but uh, a lot of interesting things can be done with people using AIs as assistance to help them do the things so that it is not AI doing it on its own, but as a way to help somebody uh, work on work on issues. It can be useful in some circumstances where someone like needs to craft a resume and a, and a cover letter and they would like some help in, in drafting it well, uh, working together. It can be done in uh, doing some research and having the AI find things, but you still have to check them. Like one of the things that uh, has come up in the in the legal world is a number of uh, lawyers have gotten in very, very big trouble when they have had AI write briefs, they submitted them to the court and then somebody noted that those cases don't exist. Uh, and this has, has led to uh, a lot of sanctions and such. Uh, so, you know, we can't give it all over, but having an assistant working with you. And I would uh, I think it's good to have a decentralized world where you would have lots of different AIs trying to help you out. How do we get there? Well, that is, that is again, the challenge we talked a bit about, the, the, you know, the technology problems. Uh, one concrete suggestion that, that I, would, I would have is bring back the Office of Technology Assessment. This was an office within the U.S. Congress that um, would provide a 
you know, it worked for Congress. It would provide a neutral, nonpartisan technology assessment of technology issues that were coming up before Congress. Uh, if people are familiar with the Congressional Research Service, it is actually a very good uh, source of information where they will do research on uh, legal issues and, and provide uh, representatives and senators with a history of the law and how things have been and like a, a report that is generally regarded as you know uh, well well put together and well well researched and relatively you know non nonpartisan. And so having the same thing, they used to have this for technology assessments, but then in a you know uh, uh, a period in which it was important to uh, uh, show efforts to cut cut down on the budget, the trivial budget for the Office of Technology Assessment was uh, was cut as a symbolic gesture, and I think Congress has been a lot worse off since then. So I guess that would be my my main concrete one for for solving uh, solving for that uh, that issue. So um, we can go go down. We can you know ask, uh, uh, talk a little bit. I see at least is that a hand being raised or are you stretching? Hand being raised. Great. Uh, we have a mic. I think uh, Scott for the professor. Uh, I think the well, mic we're, is we're for being the we're going TV. out onto onto we are being live streamed on uh, DragonCon TV right now. So we should definitely get you on the mic. So just to be upfront, um, I work in an industry that is less on the development side of AI, but more the marketing hype of AI. So my own perspective is, to be blunt, it's a scam of description of what AI is. So I'm not in favor, really, of AI as it's currently marketed. Um, I don't believe that AI as artificial intelligence, as it's often described, is accurate. It's more an amassed interpretation of just data sets that are fed into it. There really is no intelligence behind it, as I see it, and I believe others agree on that. Um, in terms of regulation, I do agree that you can't define inspiration, but you can define methodologies that are used for uh, the use cases of this type of uh, algorithms. Uh, what I did want to ask, though, is for each of your views in just a few sentences, is which do you view as the more practical and purposeful path for regulation? The regulating of data sets for training, which goes more into copyright. The regulating of use cases for the models, setting off-limit areas without peer review being done or some type of oversight, which uh, goes more into the groups that are impacted. Or regulating the terminology used uh, for what can be called AI, because currently, AI is such a blanket term that it, there's often a misunderstanding or misappropriation of what something is. They just call it AI when it's just, hey, you can draw a circle around an image and it'll tell you what the image is. That's not really AI. That's just search. That's just image recognition. Uh, and that, right, I think you've had three questions so far. So well, it's more for each of you which you think is the okay. better path for regulation. Okay. <laughs> Well, okay. So uh, I guess we have we have a set of set of possibilities for the path of regulation. I'll do some, I guess, uh, brief comments, uh, and then we can go down. Uh, so I think on the regulation of data sets, you mentioned copyright. I think privacy, as, as Amy was mentioning, is also a very very big issue there uh, on on copyright. Uh, you know, many in many cases uh, there have been cases about scraping copyrighted material and using it for for fair use. Uh, so on on the whole. Uh, that that has been uh, uh, dealt with in a lot of prior laws, but we have some other instances which are coming up now and in in the courts on uh, whether this goes beyond that. You know, you have some interesting facts like uh, there were some AIs that that showed like added G Getty Images uh, logo to uh, I think so. Getty was like this is a problem, uh, but on the whole, I I think. Existing privacy notions and and existing copyright law, well well applied, could deal with the with the data set issue, and we'll get that we'll get that resolved. And I say, I would mostly rather look at what activities that we don't want to have or want to uh, regulate, rather than on how you build the uh, build the technology, uh, and look for the pernicious, problematic uses. And that's where you look at, and then try also do something to promote the beneficial uh, uses. I guess I, I could go next. I would say yes to all of your questions. And I know it's a little bit of a cop out, but.
but I think every single issue that you raised has very important consequences for innovation and consumer protection. Um, so I think all of those things need to be regulated in some way. Um, and to make sure that, again, we're protecting consumers, we're potentially protecting like the health of people. Like one of the things that really you know, bothers me is the use of AI in different militaries um, and how they're kind of able to pre-program drone swarms and all these other terrible things, right? And so, um, you know, I, I think that we're gonna have to have a robust regulation process and I don't know if that's something along the lines, like in copyright, you have like the Berne Convention, right? Where you have all these companies that are, or countries, not companies, all these countries that agree to abide by the copyrights of other countries, right? And I think we're gonna have to have something similar um, just because it still is pretty early days on this. Um, so we're not sure what's gonna happen. And I know this runs the risk of overregulation, but I think to be safe, we're just gonna have to work through all of those and use a risk-based approach like the EU does to, to, again, make sure we're doing things the right way. Yeah, and that's all I was gonna add is that the European Union uh, assesses everything according to the actual use and certain things that are unacceptable, for example, social scoring, facial res recognition, use of, for dark matter. Um, that's basically the unacceptable, so they're looking at it strictly from a standpoint of how is it gonna be harmful to society as a whole versus the individual right of privacy or copyright as far as regulation goes. I would just like to voice my strong opposition to using copyright as a means of regulation. Um, I mean, copyright has a very specific purpose. It's to promote the creation of work and to promote the exploitation of that work and assign the, uh, the fair uh, money around to everyone that, you know, quote unquote, deserves uh, a share of that money. And uh, that is like not what a lot of people are afraid of on AI and like not the direction they're trying to do. I think that there is sort of a knee jerk uh, tendency to grab onto copyright whenever there's a significant problem because copyright has become so strong thanks to the copyright lobby that it is like a really big hammer to hit anything. Um, and I know it's a tool that has been used in the past um, to uh, the first instances of, of rent, revenge, uh, intimate imagery. Uh, they reached to IP to stop that, and it was kind of insulting to me and also ineffective, and so obviously we developed other laws. Uh, I will say that like uses and privacy and other things, these are better uh, suited tools that, to deal with the specific problems. Um, privacy, obviously, to help prevent too much of your data being used in models and, you know, regulating what can and can't be used. Um, these are more direct responses to the problems. So I think it's instructive here to look at the Colorado law, which regulates high-risk AI systems and generally has actually requirements in three categories. Um, obligations for developers of AI systems, the people who are putting them together obligations for the deployers of AI systems who are often a separate body um, and they create things that those deployers have to do, and then rights for the people implicated by AI. Um, actually saying here are the things that you get when an AI system is used and you're interacting with it. Um, there are a couple other things that it requires notice if you're interacting with an AI system um, and disclosures about the AI systems to the state attorney general. These are the categories that I think are actually right now really important. Um, I, act, I would urge us not to go down the path of regulating how to speak about AI necessarily because A, we're getting into First Amendment world, um, and B, we actually have truth in advertising laws. The Federal Trade Commission in most states have jurisdiction over companies that engage in unfair or, underline here, deceptive trade practices both of those would get to like blatant misstatements about what a company is doing. Um, we're trying to advertise on that basis and they've been time tested. Going further down that road I think is, is going to be incredibly troublesome from what we start regulating people able to talk about. And even legally, like we have a joke internally um, that again, maybe I shouldn't say on camera, but um, about definitions of AI, like does this apply to a calculator? Um, looking at like when you are legally writing up what AI encompasses, is it like that 
broad that a calculator would encompass in it. And so if you're trying to tell a company, like, don't call this AI, even legislators have a hard time defining what AI is in a way that's broad, that's narrow enough to only encompass certain things. And I think we're going down a slippery slope of just trying to tell people do or do not say this without getting into that deceptive category, which is already regulated and which we really do want to prevent. We have a, a incentive there. Well, I guess it's the, the perils of being on the end here because uh, I agree with pretty much everything that's been said. Um, you bit carrying forward the, uh, this, this, this question about what should be called AI. I, I agree you, we, we shouldn't get into the business of, of uh, uh, um, setting rules for what can be called AI um, broadly because I don't think there's, there's any uh, agency or body that, that is competent to make those calls uh, now or, or, or for the foreseeable future. But I think your question in that regard does, does touch on a really important thing, which is I think a lot of the problems of AI that people are seeing and talking about right now are problems of people using, uh, misusing things that are that are called AI. Um, in in they're, they're using them as if as if this technology were a sort of infallible oracle uh, issuing uh, a, a sort of objective and neutral decisions. Um, so that many of the things that that are uh, at the the heart of the prohibitions of the the uh, the EU. Act uh, social scoring, um, uh, you, you determining eligibility for uh, government benefits or, or use in education, you know, or, or, or so on, you know, are, are, are not so much as because the technology itself is is is, is somehow flawed, but because it, it's it's being misapplied. Um, so. Uh, the answer to that is not a law. I, I, excuse me. The answer to that is not a law on how the technology is designed, but it is laws on how the, the how the technology should and shouldn't be used, um, um, with the recognition, right, that these systems uh, encode the bias uh, present in the training data uh, and and in and, and in the assumptions of the designers. Uh, for to take a, a really salient example, using AI systems to predict crime. Uh, and there are systems being sold for this purpose, are, are not predicting where crime will happen. They're pre they are they are uh, drawing on where enforcement happens has happened in the past, which 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 of course is is, is you know predominantly in certain neighborhoods. Um, either we will tend to predict crime there and thus uh, 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 perpetuate bias while. Uh, being seen as a, a sort of a, a sort of objective and and, uh, and 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 neutral and in some sense infallible arbiter of, of decision making. So so those sorts of concerns I think really are touched in really really are touched on when we just sort of blanket label all of these things as as AI. People can do that right there you know, to to the, to the extent of. Um, false advertising uh, laws and, and, and deceptive business practices. You, you, can, you can label something AI, but that, that, that doesn't mean it's always going to give you the right answer. All right, thank you. I'd, uh, just a, a quick anecdote with the next question. Uh, just on the calculator uh, test, it's reminding me that in the, the hacking, the federal anti hacking law, they define computer so broadly that it would include a calculator, and then they have a provision saying it doesn't include calculators. So and, uh, like, the Congress couldn't figure it out. Next question, please. Okay, um, I'm Ethan, and I wanted to know about AI art in image and video generators. Do you think watermarks should be legally required? Because I've noticed that even with Meta's AI, which has watermarks, you can just crop them out if you crop them the right way. I just don't know how much of a difference it'll make, or some places might, some services might like allow you to pay to get rid of a watermark. So I just want to know, like, do you think they should be legally required? If, right. if I could jump in. Yeah, go, right, go yeah, away. Yeah, there's, there's, um, today, I don't believe there's any watermarking technology that, 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 that isn't fairly easy to remove. So, so legally requiring them is, is just not going to accomplish very much. I, I think we get farther with voluntary agreements uh, uh, on that, like, like a, a you know, uh, or, or developing norms on a on a platform or within a community to say that, that things that are AI generated ought to be ought to be flagged in some way, um, but but requiring it. Besides, again, getting into First Amendment issues, um, you also get in, you also get into to, to difficult boundary questions. Um, you, you start with something created by an image generator, and then you 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 add human creativity to it. You modify it. Right? At what point uh, is that no longer an AI generated image or video? Uh, you, you get some difficult boundary questions there that really implicate uh, um, 
be, they become laws regulating speech, and that's a problem. Yeah, I'd agree, and I just throw in one extra point that like shows how hard it is to regulate these things, and that we learned a lot from like requirements uh, around copyright and other stuff. That there's a lot of just bad faith claiming online used to like you know wage what today's version of the flame war is that like if you're upset with someone you can just claim all their images are ai generated or if you don't like the way you looked in the image you can say it was ai generated and try to get it taken down and that that becomes a free speech problem and and just a problem overall so it it's challenging to solve this problem so just to add, I think there's a lot of discussion right now about uh, machine-readable watermarks, which would mean not physical ones that you would crop out and not even ones you could see, things that exist in the back end of the image that would tell you whether or not it was AI-generated, gem which I think is really important. Um, I will add a, a difficulty to this um, that I don't think we're exploring as much because there's a lot of talk about watermarks and images from generative AI, but that's not going to solve questions around audio generated AI. Um, and so if I am getting into my, my headphones an AI response, and I'm not sure, I don't know it's an AI response, there's no watermark. I'm not looking at anything. It can't be, be clearly um, denoted to me that that is AI. And so I think we need to um, be thinking through not only the visual notification about what is AI, but also trying to indicate to people when an audio file or something, some audio message they're receiving is AI generated. All right, let's go. Um, given that they tend to be black boxes as part of the inner workings, um, is it feasible or practical to legally require transparency in AI systems in order to um, reveal biases or uh, ensure that they're not violating copyright or um, privacy? And in the interest of transparency, this question was based on a suggestion by ChatGPT. So. <laughs> All right, so the, the ChatGPT is self-regulating. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, the, you know, I, I think so. Um, I think that we're going to have to have some type of framework to understand the impact of AI on its use case, like for that specific instance. Like, are you using AI to um, send out advertising for mortgage loans, right? Okay, well, you can't discriminate based upon, you know, class, color, creed when, you know, giving a mortgage loan. Um, so, but what if the data being put into that is naturally discriminatory, right? Or if the, the algorithm framework is. So, again, I mean, I, I know that it's gonna be hard to regulate, but I think, kind of disagreeing a little bit and very respectfully with some of the comments that were just made in regards of like defining AI or talking about AI. Like as long as you have a definition, I feel like you can then interpret that definition, right? It might not be the most expansive or most technologically accurate, but when you get a baseline, you can now say, okay, for purposes of this rule or law or what have you, this is what AI is, now we can move forward in, in evaluating it and what, what it needs to be done. So I, I think that we can do that and I think we're gonna need to do that, but again, it's very easy for me to say that, it's gonna be very, very difficult to actually implement. And I will say that there are ways of doing transparency even with the fact that the model <clears throat> is not necessarily explainable. Um, and that includes like offering the model um, up for researchers to test for biases. It includes things like, um, you know, opening up the training data sets um, to what it's trained on, which companies hate because they haven't answered the copyright question yet. Um, and, uh, you know, like things like the hidden prompt that um, gets put in front of your real prompt, stuff like that. There's lots of ways of doing transparency that will also be beneficial. And the European law requires that sort of transparency. So if we follow something similar, then yes, there is a means to do it. Great. Yeah, I, mean, I think just to add one other thing, you know, with, one of the challenges with uh, you know, uh, AI is, that is what is the data set? And knowing what data set was used for a particular thing, and then that data set was in fact the data set that you expected to be used on, on it uh, and wasn't... Uh, uh, modified uh, without un unknowingly and, and changed since the the original and things like that would be a useful form of, of transparency to be able to sort of assess what 
uh, and AI was doing. But as I said, many of the laws do have transparency provisions, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll see this evolve. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. My name's Roland. So I would say you all have a very challenging problem ahead, <laughs> trying to at least give guidance on a problem which is constantly changing and only getting better every day, is that, you know, efficiently. Um, how do you see regulation in 10 years from now, given how technology is moving forward? And the last thing, I'm going to do some research on the social scoring for governments. I think it sounds really bad, but in a sense, in some aspects, we're kind of doing that already. Um, if you look at credit scores, granted, you're not using supervised, you're not using models, but you are 100% being judged off your credit score, which could say how you interact with society. Not the question I have for you, but just something I was just thinking about. So um, thank you. Um, I, I, I want to introduce a slight disagreement with some of the things my fellow panelists have said that I think is partly in response, which is um, I think with AI, lawmakers are really trying to get this right. Um, there is a working group of more than 200 state lawmakers, staffers, um, policy experts um, that we work with that have talked to technologists, they've talked to advocates, they've talked to people across the board with expertise in this space. Um, and they did that before the Colorado Act was passed, before the um, Connecticut Act was almost passed. It was um, not signed by the governor, so it got through, but, but didn't make it into law. Um, and that has provided a really good basis for them to understand what is happening here. Um, we might not have the, um, the, OT, the technological assessment office that Kurt talked about in Congress, but we have programs to put technologists into s members' offices um, who are out there writing legislation, analyzing, providing expert advice. So um, the part of answering your question is I think in 10 years actually on this track, like members, we, the, the Facebook example of a member of Congress not getting Facebook, um, not understanding it and asking not necessarily the most educated questions, um, it gets brought up a lot, but members heard that. They actually like were looking at it and saying, we don't want to do this again. And they've tried to respond by getting more expertise in. Um, I'm not going to say it's perfect. I'm not gonna sit up here and say like, if you ask a member of Congress, they're gonna be able to know everything. There is still a flip phone caucus um, in Congress in Washington, D.C., of people who are very proud that they do not have a smartphone. Um, but they, they're working on it, they're striving to get it right, and Governor Polis in Colorado with that law um, has said, like, this is not the end. We have two years. It doesn't go into effect until 2026. We actually plan to revisit it before it goes into effect. We don't think we passed the perfect law even before people have to comply with it. Let's go back and look at it again. So I am... Um, cautiously optimistic, um, although we still don't have a federal privacy law. I've said I would say this on every panel, so I will. Um, so I don't know if we're gonna see a federal AI thing, but we, we might see it in the States and, and see something good. I, I would definitely agree with that. My uh, frame of reference is Congress. I know that states seem to be doing a lot more um, of, the. I don't want to insult anyone, but they seem to be a little bit more intellectually curious and willing to resist politics. Whereas, you know, as someone that has to watch a lot of congressional hearings for their job, uh, oftentimes the sort of politics and the uh, quest for a good clip <laughs> gets in the way of honest conversation. I think one of the most infuriating moments was during the CEO hearing when uh, I probably because he wasn't prepped well enough, but the Discord CEO seemed to be about to launch into an honest conversation about the uh, the issues with content moderation that they're working on and was cut off to be yelled at. <laughs> and I really wanted to hear what he was gonna say. Um, so that's sort of like a tension. I think that like a lot of smart people are trying to avoid that. There was um, the, the Chuck Schumer framework for educating members on AI. I thought it was very promising and good that they were experimenting with that. I think that most people were disappointed in like how it ended up. Um, but I hope that Congress continues to attempt to try new things and become more intellectually curious and to um, find new ways of sort of uh, grappling with these more complex issues. 
if, if I could just throw one stone into this mostly rosy picture that I mostly agree with, I do think there is a serious risk that, that, that we, you know, we are going to end up with, with an ill-considered law most likely related to copyright uh, because there seems to be appetite in Congress for some uh, new ill-considered copyright experimentation really to advance sort of, sort of the, the, the agendas of major media and entertainment companies uh, uh, through the lens of AI. Uh, and th there, is, there, is a, there is a serious danger of that right now that we need to guard against uh, um, that would uh, really potentially halt a lot of beneficial progress and a lot of, a lot of good and, so and societally useful uh, applications of AI. There's one uh, thing I wanted to add. You were mentioning about the social scoring and, and the credit scores. And within the uh, EU AI Act, it does have a prohibition uh, that you know, they're not doing uh, social scoring of natural persons by public or private actors, except for lawful evaluation practices of natural persons that are carried out for a specific purpose in accordance with union and national laws. Uh, and if, if you're saying like there's an exception for things that are in, in accordance with law, that does allow for the potential for doing these sort of things saying, well, we're not allowing it for social scoring, but this thing is fine, and then use something like credit scoring, which then ends up potentially being used in a way that is pernicious and you know un undercuts the law. This is one of the challenges of, of sort of writing these laws well. I think they, governments do want to have a credit scoring system because they don't want to undermine that aspect of, of how people do credit. And trying to balance between them can end up creating some, some loopholes. All right, we just have. Thank you. Uh, and one last question. I think we're, we're coming right on the end of time. Yeah. So, um, hello. So, uh, as a law student taking evidence right now, I'm a little concerned about the evidentiary implications of AI in terms of either fabricating evidence, editing it somehow, especially in a criminal law context. So, I'm curious if any of you have uh, thoughts about the implications of AI for evidence. Uh, is that a regulatory issue? Is it something that the courts should just figure out for themselves? Uh, yeah. So I, I could start that off. So part of my practice involves um, professional liability like claims for lawyers. And we've had some AI claims that come in, um, specifically in regards to um, using different learning language models to assist them in, in their legal work. and. It, it really has created like false information, right? And so translating that to kind of the criminal context, I think this is something that's gonna be handled within the courts. I think that they will probably update the federal rules of evidence eventually, um, thereby which will then trickle down to the states, right? So. I, I think that's something that the courts are going to handle, and I, I think that we've seen a couple of the circuits put out some some preemptive rulemaking or like discussions for it. Um, don't test me on which one because I forget. But I mean, I, I do think it's a real problem. I think it's a great question, and but I, I don't think that, in my opinion, I'm not sure that that's something that would be legislated or a regulatory body would do. I think it might be specific to the the court systems and those specific courts that are are dealing with it. Yeah, I would add that with respect to the prior question on watermarking, this is exactly why I think watermarking might be a good idea, that you have machine readable for precisely that reason, to give some kind of trace of evidence and then you can determine to use in a court, because otherwise you don't want you know, 12 people on a jury trying to figure out something that they have absolutely no clue about. So it's a great question. I think it's something as technology develops, hopefully it will be used uh, for exactly that reason. I think we should just make every AI generated image or whatever an NFT, <laughs> right? Uh, and so we'll have it, you know, immutable on the block. This is a joke, by the way. I'm not actually serious, but uh, you know, something along those lines, right? So um, 
one of the things I just point out that like this is not a new problem. Like Photoshop has been able to make uh, you know mo modified images and photographs can be used you know a as evidence or people even uh, in uh, you know darkroom uh, photography can can create some. So I got got to got to wrap up here, but just note that there are, there already are laws that are, are against faking evidence, and in many cases, your criminal charge for faking em evidence or destruction of evidence will be higher than the crime that you are charged with. So it would be a, kind of a bad idea. But then we are end of time. So thank you all very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your questions, and thank you to all my panelists. Thank you all. Thank you.